Hello and welcome to the May edition of ISGIP Live Journal Club. I'm your host and moderator, Karen Talia, broadcasting live from Melbourne, Australia. And joining me on the panel from the ISGIP Live team today is Dr. Natalie Binet, who's in Cleveland in the United States. Now, some of you joining us today are ISGIP members, and to those who are not, we hope that this session encourages you to join the society. The membership fees are discounted if you're practicing in a developing country, and they're entirely waived if you're a trainee. And you can find out more information on joining ISGIP on the ISGIP website. So our topic for this month is non-serous tumours of the ovary, and we've got two pathology trainees and a pathology fellow, all from Australia, presenting today. Next slide, please. So as regular audience members know, Journal Club alternates between the USA and Australia month by month, with Dr Natalie Benet and I alternating hosting these sessions. And there's our email addresses there if you want to re reach out and be in touch. Next slide is the remaining schedule for 2022. Um, so I am almost fully booked, um, which is really quite exciting. There's a lot of enthusiasm for Journal Club, but I still have a couple of sessions left for the November gynae cytology sessions. So if, if you're interested, please send me an email and we'll um, set you up. Um, and equally, if you'd like to join next year's um, Journal Clubs, just send me an email and I can put you in the calendar for a session in 2023. Next slide. So these are our learning objectives for Journal Club. Our primary aim is to engage junior and trainee pathologists in critically evaluating the literature and honing their presentation skills in a mentored and supportive environment. We'll provide you with a journal article and we will offer written feedback on your presentation and we'll also run an online practice session to help build confidence using this digital format. Next slide. We also provide a PowerPoint template to help you put your presentation together. And this is a summary of that template and the main steps that we follow when we're working through and appraising an article. Next slide. So also remember if a case-based presentation is more appealing to you, you can consider participating in Dr. Jennifer Bennett's interesting case presentation series. So this runs to a similar format as Journal Club with three cases per session and mentorship in the lead up to the day. And you don't have to be an ISGIP member to participate in any of these events. And as I said, ISGIP membership is free to trainees. Next slide. So to attend Journal Club as an audience member or any ISGIP live educational event, register via the ISGIP educational website at isgip.ca. And this is a screenshot from the website. And if you scroll down on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the individual sessions and links um, to register to those sessions. So do that, then you'll be sent a reminder ahead of the session and a video link afterwards to watch the recording if you missed out on the live event. And recordings of Journal Club are also posted to YouTube. So I'll just quickly go over a couple of upcoming events. Next slide, please. The first one is um, Dr. Jennifer Bennett presenting the interesting case presentation session on May 25 at 8 a.m. US Eastern. And digital slides can be pre previewed prior to the session. Um, you'll find that link on the egypt.ca website. Um, and this month we've got a couple of cervical and a vaginal lesion um, being presented. And the next slide um, is the other upcoming event, which is a podcast titled Immunohistochemistry in the Diagnosis of Differentiated VIN with Dr. Stephanie Scala, hosted by Carlos Paraharan. And this episode goes live on the same day um, on the ISGIP Live SoundCloud page. And I'll definitely be tuning in for this one because I find this one of the hardest areas in vulvar pathology. Um, next slide. Finally, before we get started, this is an interactive session. And if you'd like to ask questions as we go along, please use the Q&A function and just type your question in there. And we'll address these at the conclusion of the three talks. Um, please also, I encourage you to use the chat function for any general comments. Say hello, tell us where in the world you're joining us from, give our speakers some encouragement. And also remember at the end to fill out the evaluation form. Okay, next slide is our schedule for today. This month's theme is non-serous ovarian tumours, and we've got three excellent papers dealing with the spectrum, both of daily dilemmas and also a newly described entity. All of our speakers today are from Australia. We've got Dr. Theone Harolobopoulos. She's presenting a paper on the phenomenon of silver pattern A, endocervical adenocarcinomas metastasizing to the ovary. 
Dr. Reshma Pajari is presenting a paper shedding light on a likely under-recognised phenomenon, which is WT1 staining in endometrioid ovarian tumours. And Dr. Leah Haralobopoulos presenting a paper expanding the morphologic spectrum of the recently described mesonephric-like tumours. Next slide, thanks. So now I'm really pleased to introduce our three speakers for today. First, we've got Dr. Theoni Haralobopoulos, who's a first year trainee in New South Wales at the Douglas Hanley Moyer Pathology. Next is Dr. Reshma Pujari, who's a fellow in anatomical pathology at Austin Health here in Melbourne. And lastly, Dr. Leah Haralobopoulos, also a first year trainee in Sydney at Douglas Hanley Moyer Pathology. So with that, we'll move over to Dr. Theoni Haralobopoulos and um, the only ask you to share your screen. Um, we'll all turn our cameras and microphones off and the podium is yours. Um, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present at the Gynae Pathology Journal Club. Um, so the article that I'll be presenting, sorry, is um, titled The Clinical um, morphologic and molecular features associated with ovarian metastases from pattern A and the cervical adenocarcinomas. Um, this is by um, Feinberg and Hodgson and colleagues. The study aims were to characterize the clinicopathologic and molecular features of silver pattern A and the cervical adenocarcinomas or EAs with ovarian metastases, either synchronous or metachronous, in a cohort of patients, of eight patients, um, to determine the features of silver pattern AEAs associated with increased risk of ovarian metastases and to document the clinical outcomes for the study cohort. So a bit about the silver system, it's a classification system for HPV associated EAs based on morphologic patterns of stromal invasion. Um, it predicts the risk of lymph node metastasis and recurrence with pattern A demonstrating no destructive stromal invasion or lymphovascular invasion, and represents no risk of lymph node involvement or recurrence, whereas patterns B and C require lymph node dissection. This is a typical pattern A EA, um, consisting of well demarcated glands um, with rounded contours infiltrating into the cervical wall without destructive stromal invasion. So ovarian metastases from EAs, although they're rare, they're well described, um, having been reported um, in adenocarcinomas, even with um, AIS-like growth patterns. However, however, there are no clearly defined pathologic parameters to accurately stratify patients with EAs at increased risk of ovarian metastases. So this was a single institution retrospective chart review conducted from 2008 to 2021 to identify patients diagnosed with HPV associated EA with ovarian metastases. Um, listed here is the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, listed here is the demographic and clinical information that was recorded. And the following pathologic parameters were also assessed, including tumor subtype and differentiation. A stage was also assigned according to the FIGO 2009 classification. Next generation sequencing was performed on five of the tumors. So results, the patients ranged in age from 31 to 58 years with the median age being 38 years at the time of initial diagnosis. All four patients with synchronous ovarian metastases were presumed to have primary ovarian neoplasms preoperatively, so one unilateral and three bilateral. So therefore the diagnosis of EA was not known in any of these four patients and all patients underwent surgical staging for ovarian carcinoma, which included total open hysterectomy and bilateral subcongo ophorectomy. And this highlights the occult nature of the cervical primary neoplasm. Of the patients with the metachronous ovarian metastases, they all presented with abnormal pap tests 
and bilateral salpingectomy was performed in two of the patients, while the, two pa other, while the other two patients retained their fallopian tubes. The time to development of metaquinous ovarian metastases ranged from five months to a very prolonged 171 months. So this is a table here outlining the clinical and pathologic features of pattern A EAs with ovarian metastases, most of which we've covered, including the age, the presenting symptoms and the initial surgery. Notably, the AA subtype indicates a predominance of mucinous differentiation of either intestinal or endocervical or not otherwise specified type, specifically in five of the eight tumors. And this is illustrated here um, with the first figure demonstrating abundant um, apically located mucin and the second figure um, demonstrating goblet cell differentiation um, or intestinal type tumor. So none of the eight cervical tumors um, were ma macroscopically visible and were therefore measured microscopically. So the table here is demonstrating that in five of the six accessible lesions, they all measured um, more than one centimeter with two of the six lesions being more than two centimeters. And therefore these lesions had quite a large horizontal extent offering covering an entire slide um, or extending into the uterine corpus and um, likely resulting in underestimation of um, the size of some tumors. Um, this is another table continuing to outline the clinical and pathologic features of pattern A EAs with ovarian metastases. Notably, corpus involvement um, was seen in five of the eight cases. So this is shown here where the um, increased glandular complexity and the mucinous nature of the endocervical tumor contrasts with the, um, with the simple nature of the endometrial glands. Um, also in two of the three cases without um, colonization, the endometrium was not entirely submitted for histologic examination. Furthermore, um, ovarian metastases tended to be quite large. So with it, the mean size was 12.5 centimeters and they ranged from three to 25 centimeters. So this tendency for large size, as well as the architectural patterns, typical of primary ovarian epithelial neoplasms, including cyst adenomatous and borderline-like foci, um, created the potential for um, misdiagnosis as an ovarian primary. So in this image, the tumor appears quite cystic and, and is composed of relatively simple glands um, in a fibromatous background, reminiscent of a cyst adenoma. However, the indicators for metastasis was the fact that um, there was grossly evident exophytic or polypoid surface involvement described in two tumors and ovarian surface involvement was confirmed microscopically in four cases. And we can see here that surface involvement without um, evident parenchymal involvement by borderline light tumor. So um, the potential for misdiagnosis is emphasized by the fact that even after the identification of the endocervical tumor, Two ovar ovarian tumors were still thought to be separate and unrelated and um, originally diagnosed as um, an intestinal type mucinous borderline tumor and mixed endometrioid and mucinous carcinoma. And it required ancillary studies in the um, form of P16 and HPV in situ hybridization to confirm the cervical nature. And so this reinforces the fact that metastatic EA to the ovaries can masquerade as an ovarian primary. So molecular findings um, really demonstrate the predominance of three types of mutations being um, GNAS, KRAS, and ARID1A. And notably the three tumors with um, lung metastases um, harbored KRAS um, mutations. Um, so discussions. So 
this study's identification of eight pattern AEAs that metastasize to the ovaries suggests an alternative method of ovarian involvement distinct from the features that define high-risk disease, including lymphovascular invasion and deep stromal involvement. Um, despite the pattern A's, EAs metastasizing to the ovaries and other sites in this study, um, there was no nodal involvement identified. So this lack of lymph node involvement supports the supposition that ovarian metastasis is not necessarily caused by vascular invasion. And this lack of association between ovarian involvement and lymph node metastases has been previously reported. So the first mechanism of tumor spread discussed is intraepithelial spread along the endometrium into the tube and eventually into the ovary. However, this does not explain metachronous ovarian metastases in patients with prior salpingectomies or patients with intact tubes whose cervical tumors were removed at a decade or more previously. In the study cohort, two patients with metachronous ovarian involvement after bilateral salpingectomy were both less than 1.5 years out from the initial surgery, while two patients with intact tubes had their initial surgeries nine to 14 years previously. So this finding raises the questions of whether ovarian involvement by EA can occur early in the disease course, or whether some ovarian metastases can lie dormant for long periods of time, clinically and radiologically imperceptible. An alternative method of ovarian involvement is tumor cell exfoliation from the tumor surface. And this is commonly seen in endometrial and fallopian tube serous carcinomas. Although they're not, they're not thought Although this is not thought to typically um, apply to EAs, it could be particularly applicable to exophytic or villoglandular tumors. Um, it could also explain ovarian, peritoneal, and a mental involvement in cases without corpus or tubal colonization by EAs. Um, so ovarian vascular invasion um, could explain the finding of lung involvement in three of the patients in the study with the chronology um, particularly favoring, favoring this disease um, route. So two patients developed lung metastases, 39 and 125 months after ovarian involvement. One patient developed lung and pleural metastases at the same time as ovarian involvement um, at 171 months. However, ovarian vascular involvement was not identified in the study. So as previously mentioned, um, the study cohort was enriched with a higher proportion of tumors with extensive mucinous differentiation at 63%. And this has been reported to behave more aggressively than tumors without significant mucinous differentiation. Corpus extension was also a dominant feature. Previous studies of the mutational characteristics of the three silver patterns established the limited mutational spectrum of pattern A EAs. However, this study demonstrates a greater mutation burden. So in four of the five tested tumors at 80%, um, they demonstrated activating mutations in KRAS, a much greater proportion than that previously observed, for example, by this study by Spans and colleagues where KRAS mutations were documented in 20% in um, of pattern A EAs. Also, GNAS mutations occurred at a higher proportion, and the identification of ARID 1A was also a rare finding um, in HPV-associated EAs, and is more common usually in endometrioid adenocarcinomas and ovarian cleave cell carcinomas. So in conclusion, um, the metastatic potential of EAs can be assessed by features other than those distinguished as high risk by the silver classification system, particularly the presence of mucinous differentiation, corpus involvement, and certain mutations. Even pattern A tumors that are spread beyond the cervix appear to exhibit no risk of nodal involvement, supporting an alternative method of spread and the mutational profile of EAs can differ between tumors involving the ovaries versus tumors that don't.
So the strengths of this study um, is the fact that EAs with ovarian involvement have not been studied or previously described in the context of the silver um, classification system. Um, the study also highlights the potential for under-recognition or misdiagnosis of metastatic EA to the ovary as an ovarian primary neoplasm, particularly as they can present, often present before the cervical primary or um, many years after the initial diagnosis. The limitations include the retrospective nature with um, a multi-institutional study likely being necessary to draw more than observational conclusions, um, as well as a small number of cases. However, given the rarity, um, this was a relatively large number. Applications. So ovarian and extra ovarian involvement should be discussed with patients with pattern AEAs at the time of surgical planning despite the established safety of ovarian preservation in early stage disease. And where ovarian preservation is being considered, it would be prudent to diligently search out and document these features of mucinous differentiation, corpus involvement, and the presence of certain mutations. Metastatic EA should always be considered in the differential diagnosis of adenocarcinoma in the ovary, especially in women of childbearing age. So the potential for long-standing disease or presentation before recognition of the cervical primary may result in misdiagnosis as an ovarian primary neoplasm. And molecular characterization of EAs may more precisely aid in treatment planning and prognostication, as the presence of certain mutations may increase the risk of recurrence. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Theoni. What an interesting paper. It almost raises more questions than it answers, I think. Um, really well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So you can... Thank you. Um, thank you. So we'll now move on to Reshma Pujari. Um, Reshma, when you're ready, um, you can share your screen. And we we'll look forward to your talk on WT1 staining in ovarian endometrioid tumours. Thank you. Hello everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to present today with special thanks to Karen Talia. Today I will be discussing this paper titled WT1 Positive Ovarian Endometrioid Tumors, Observations from Consult Cases and Strategies for Distinguishing from Serous Neoplasms. Ovarian endometrioid carcinomas demonstrate a varied morphology which can cause problems in diagnosis. They exhibit morphologic overlap with a variety of neoplasms, including high-grade serous carcinoma, low-grade serous carcinoma, clear cell carcinoma, mucinous carcinoma, sex cord stromal tumors, and metastatic adenocarcinomas, especially colorectal. Even though they comprise only about 11% of ovarian carcinomas, they account for a disproportionately high number of referral cases compared to their incidence. WT1 is a sensitive and specific marker of both high-grade and low-grade serous carcinoma, and is considered a useful adjunct to help distinguish tuber ovarian serous carcinoma from endometrioid carcinoma. However, ovarian endometrioid carcinomas may be WT1 positive. Although this has been reported in the literature, it is not widely appreciated by pathologists, resulting in diagnostic confusion and seeking of expert opinions. These carcinomas have a propensity to exhibit an aberrant Im immunophenotype. Therefore, in classical cases of endometrioid carcinoma, diagnostic immunohistochemistry is not recommended. The purpose of the study is to describe the experience of the authors, with a series of ovarian endometrioid neoplasms received mainly in consultation, where WT1 staining often diffuse, resulted in misdiagnosis, or at least questioning the diagnosis of endometrioid carcinoma. The cases were predominantly derived from the consultation files of one of the authors, Professor McCluggage. There were 19 consult cases and four in-house cases. Available h &E slides and IHC slides were reviewed. WT1 and other markers were performed on the in-house cases, cases as the differential diagnosis included an endometrioid neoplasm and serous neoplasm. Any extent of WT1 staining was regarded as positive. Focal if less than 50% or diffuse if greater than 50%. Other data recorded included patient age, tumor site, type, grade, 
stage and presence of associated endometriosis, squamous elements, and adenofibromatous elements. The median patient age was 56. There were 23 cases in total. 18 cases involved a single ovary, two cases involved bilateral ovaries, and three were extra ovarian. The original favored diagnoses in the consult cases included serous borderline tumor, low-grade serous carcinoma, high-grade serous carcinoma, serous carcinoma difficult to further classify, endometrioid carcinoma, sex god stromal tumor, and no preferred diagnosis was provided in two cases. The final diagnoses included borderline endometrioid tumor, low-grade endometrioid carcinoma, and high-grade endometrioid carcinoma. One endometrioid carcinoma was not graded since the patient had received chemotherapy for breast carcinoma before the ovarian mass was discovered and removed, therefore affecting tumor morphology. Endometriosis was identified in the same ovary in six of seven cases. Squamous elements were identified in seven cases. Benign endometrioid adenofibroma was associated with six cases of endometrioid carcinoma, and a borderline endometrioid tumor was associated with two cases of endometrioid carcinoma. On histology, many of the tumors showed well-formed glands and solid elements of typical endometrioid carcinoma, but others had a variable papillary architecture raising the suspicion of a serous neoplasm. Nuclei were generally moderately atypical with conspicuous but not high mitotic activity. The cases in the study showed extremely varied morphology, including one case showing spindle cell and sex god-like elements. All cases exhibited nuclear staining with WT1, Diffuse staining was present in 11 cases. P53 was performed in 18 cases, 15 showed wild type staining and three cases showed mutation type staining. P16 was focal or showed a mosaic staining pattern in all 15 cases where this was performed. Vimentin and ER was either focal or diffuse in all cases where this was undertaken. WT1 is a tumor suppressor gene. According to the WHO 2020 Blue Book, Positive staining for WT1 is seen in 97% of high-grade serous carcinomas and 98 to 100% of low-grade serous carcinomas. In a number of older studies, WT1 expression was largely reported as negative in ovarian endometrioid carcinomas, and therefore it is widely used to distinguish tubo ovarian serous carcinomas from endometrioid carcinoma. In a more recent study by Kobel et al., ovarian endometrioid carcinomas were shown to be WT1 positive. The most common diagnosis in these difficult referral cases was serous carcinoma, with a diagnosis of high-grade serous carcinoma in six cases, and a diagnosis of serous carcinoma difficult to further classify in four cases, followed by other diagnoses. A recurring theme in the consult cases was that although a diagnosis of serous carcinoma was favored, it was difficult to classify due to the degree of nuclear atypia and mitotic activity overlapping between that expected in typical low-grade and high-grade serous carcinoma. This case was originally diagnosed as difficult to classify serous carcinoma. Panels A and B show glandular and papillary structures, and on higher power shows moderate nuclear atypia and mitotic figures. WT1 shows diffuse nuclear staining. P53 shows wild type stain staining. Vimentin and P16 show focal positive staining. The final diagnosis in this case was grade one endometrioid carcinoma. Most of the tumors in this series were characterized by cells with moderately atypical nuclei and conspicuous but not particularly high mitotic activity. In comparison, a low-grade serous carcinoma is characterized by bland nuclear features and, sc and scattered mitotic figures, whereas a high-grade serous carcinoma is characterized by marked nuclear atypia and high mitotic activity. Therefore, when faced with a WT1-positive neoplasm that is difficult to classify as low-grade or high-grade serous carcinoma, a diagnosis of endometrioid carcinoma should be considered. The original diagnosis in this case was high-grade serous carcinoma. Panel A shows focal adenofibromatous architecture with widely separated glands within a fibrous stroma. Panels B and C show closely packed atypical glands with squamous morals. WT1 shows diffuse nuclear staining, P53 shows wild type staining, and Vimentin shows diffuse staining. The final diagnosis in this case is grade two endometrioid carcinoma. 
In the distinction between endometrial carcinoma and serous carcinoma, accompanying features such as an adenofibromatous background, endometriosis, and squamous elements favor an endometrioid proliferation. Positive staining for vimentin and loss of staining for P10, arid 1A, or mismatch repair proteins favors an endometrioid neoplasm. Rarely, somoma bodies may be seen in endometrioid neoplasms, and occasionally endometriosis may occur in association with low-grade serous carcinoma and high-grade serous carcinoma. This case was originally diagnosed as a serous borderline tumor due to fibrous stromal cause. However, areas of glandular confluence with stromal exclusion are seen. WT1 shows focal positive nuclear staining, Vimentin shows diffuse positive staining, and P53 shows wild-type staining. The overall morphology and immunophenotype is that of a grade one endometrioid carcinoma. As seen in this case, when there is focal papillary architecture, occasionally endometrioid carcinomas may be misdiagnosed as a serous borderline tumor. In the distinction between an endometrioid neoplasm and a low-grade serous neoplasm, particular attention should be paid to the nuclear features. A low-grade serous carcinoma is characterized by bland nuclear features and very low mitotic activity, and the architecture is predominantly micropapillary and the papillae are often surrounded by cliffs. Whereas low-grade endometrioid carcinomas tend to have a predominantly glandular architecture. Tumor cell necrosis would be more in keeping with, it, with an endometrioid carcinoma as this is rare in low-grade serous carcinoma. B53 and WT1 are the two most useful markers in distinguishing endometrioid carcinoma from a high-grade serous carcinoma. In a tubo ovarian carcinoma, the coexistence of these two markers is highly specific for a high-grade serous carcinoma. However, positive WT1 and mutation type P53 staining can occur at a frequency of approximately 10% in ovarian endometrioid carcinomas, and they can co-occur in 1% of cases. In this series, three cases showed mutation type P53 expression together with WT1 positive staining. Two of the three cases were grade two endometrioid carcinomas. TP53 mutations with mutation type P53 staining occurs in a small percentage of low-grade ovarian endometrioid carcinomas. One case was a high-grade endometrioid carcinoma with P53 mutation type staining in predominantly solid elements or high-grade areas and wild type staining in predominantly glandular elements or low-grade areas. These three neoplasms were classified as endometrioid carcinoma rather than high-grade serous carcinoma based on morphology, the presence of grossly and histologically normal fallopian tubes, and the presence of squamous morals and endometriosis in one and two cases, respectively. In the presence of two grossly and histologically normal fallopian tubes, which have been examined in their entirety using CFRIM protocol, a high-grade serous carcinoma is unlikely. P16 shows focal mosaic staining in endometrioid carcinomas, High-grade serous carcinomas show diffuse block type staining in about two-thirds of cases. In this series, P16 was performed in 15 cases and none exhibited block type reactivity. Some of the neoplasms in this series showed typical morphology for endometrioid carcinomas, and the only reason a serous tumor was suspected was because WT1 was positive. Ovarian endometrioid carcinomas can exhibit an aberrant immunophenotype causing diagnostic problems. Variable positive staining with WT1, CDX2, CK20, SATB2, and TTF1 can be seen. Occasional negative staining with ER, PAX8, CA125, and CK7 can be seen. CDX2 and SATB2 expression has been reported in squamous morals and glandular elements. Given the propensity for ovarian endometrioid carcinoma to be confused morphologically with metastatic colorectal adenocarcinoma, this may result in diagnostic difficulties. The strengths of this study include the experience of author Professor McCluggage and the clear strategies provided to help distinguish neoplasms with morphologic overlap based on both morphology and immunohistochemistry. The main limitation in the study is that most cases were consult cases. Not all slides were available for review. There is no mention of how extensively these neoplasms were sampled. Immunohistochemistry markers performed on each case was variable. For example, P53 and P16 were not performed on all cases. Fallopian tubes were not examined in their entirety using CFIM protocol in all cases. In conclusion, the authors give us clear strategies to distinguish endometrioid carcinoma from low-grade serous carcinoma and high-grade serous carcinoma when there's morphologic overlap. 
with particular attention paid to features such as endometriosis, squamous elements, and an adenofibromatous component. When the morphology is classical of an endometrioid carcinoma, diagnostic immunohistochemistry is not required. Ovarian endometrioid carcinomas can be WT1 positive. A panel of markers rather than a single marker should be used in the distinction between endometrioid and serous neoplasms. The authors discuss the phenomenon of aberrant immunohistochemical staining in endometrioid carcinoma. And a diagnosis of high-grade serous, car serous carcinoma is unlikely with two grossly and histologically normal fallopian tubes. Thank you. Thank you, Reshma. Excellent. Really nice talk. Thank you. Um, I'm guilty of not knowing about this aberrant WT1 staining um, in ovarian endometrial customs, so I certainly learned something from this paper. And I also like the, the cautionary um, note about not needing to do immuno um, on cases that are morphologically straightforward. So I found this paper really useful. All right, let's now move to our third speaker, Leah. Um, Leah, when you're ready, I'll ask you to share your screen and um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity to present. So my article is extrauterine mesonephric like neoplasms expanding the morphologic spectrum. So mesonephric like adenocarcinomas, MLAs, are rare neoplasms arising in the uterine corpus and ovary. MLAs have similar morphological, immunohistochemical and molecular patterns to cervical mesonephric adenocarcinomas, which are neoplasms that arise from normal or hypoplastic mesonephric remnants of the uterine cervix. There is uncertainty as to whether MLAs are of mesonephric or malarian origin. So this study composed of five cases of extrauterine mesonephric-like neoplasms with associations. So the cases were MLA with extra ovarian endometriosis, ovarian MLA with mature teratoma, one with high-grade serous carcinoma, one with borderline um, ovarian endometrioid tumour with mesonephric differentiation, and one ovarian MLA with mixed germ cell tumour. So the study goes to the clinical, pathologic, immunohistochemical and molecular features of each of the cases. So some background on mesonephric like adenocarcinomas. So they have an unclear histogenesis. And due to the uncertainty as to whether these neoplasms represent true mesonephric adenocarcinomas that arise in the uterine corpus or ovary, or whether they're malarian carcinomas that closely mimic mesonephric adenocarcinoma, it was suggested that the term MLA be used. And these have been included in the recent 2020 WHO classification. So in terms of their histologic features, so they almost always occur as pure neoplasms and they have a variety of growth patterns and tubular and glandular patterns predominate. A frequent finding is the presence of small tubules containing luminal eosinophilic colloid-like material and squamous and mucinous differentiations are generally absent. Cytologically, the tumor cells have vesicular angulated, often overlapping nuclei and the nuclear features are reminiscent of those in papillary thyroid carcinoma. So here are some images of the histology. So they have prominent tubular architecture at times, and at times they also have papillary architecture, as you can see in the middle image. On the image of the right, you can see that their nuclei are generally vesicular angulated, often overlapping. So in regards to their immunohistochemistry, they are normally GATA3 and TTF1 positive, and these usually are in an inverse staining pattern. GATA3 is regarded as the best overall marker. They are normally PAX8 diffusely positive, ER, PR negative, P16 negative, P53 has a wild type staining normally, and CD10 and calretinin are expressed in a proportion of cases. In regards to the molecular patterns, so KRAS, PIK3CA and ARID1A mutations are commonly reported in MLA, and they have similar molecular events to those seen in mesonephric adenocarcinomas. 
In regards to the methods, five cases of extrauterine mesonephric-like proliferations with associations were derived from the institutions to which the authors are affiliated and from the referral practice of one of the authors. The immunohistochemistry was performed at the original institutions during the reporting of the cases and the markers are, are displayed here. So a targeted 69 gene solid tumor panel was for cases one to four. Targeted NGS was performed for case five. Copy number variation analysis was performed for cases two and five and FISH analysis was also carried out for case five. So in regards to the clinical pathologic features, so the cases, um, the ages of the patients ranged from 30 to 82. Four cases were ovarian in origin, and as you can see, had an extra ovarian origin arising in endometriosis of the mesocolon. In three of the cases, an MLA was associated with a second tumour, namely a tumour for case two, a high-grade serous carcinoma in case three, and a mixed germ cell tumour in case five. The other ovarian case, which was case four, was a borderline endometrial tumour with elements of mesonephric-like glands. In regards to the MLA components histopathology, there was a variety of growth patterns, including glandular, tubular, and papillary. A proportion of the small tubules contained that luminal eosinophilic colloid-like material. And cytologically, the tumour cells were uniform and angulated, round to oval, crowded, and overlapping vesicular nuclei. No squamous or mucinous elements were identified, and there was no associated endometriosis seen in any of the ovarian cases. In regards to the MLA's IHC, all five cases were ER and PR negative. All five cases were positive for GATA3 and PAX8. Four of the five cases were positive for TTF1, and all four cases exhibited wild type immunoreactivity for P53. So case one's histopathology, which was the MLA associated with the extra ovarian endometriosis, as you can see in images A and B, the endometriosis component had endometrioid type glands, some cystically dilated. As you can see in images C and D, the MLA was composed of glands and a corded pattern with some glands having the luminal eosinophilic colloid-like material, as you can see in image E. Image F shows ER negative in the MLA and positive in the endometrioid glands. In regards to case two's histopathology, the ovarian MLA associated with the mature teratoma. As you can see in image A, the mature teratoma component was composed of mature cartilage and respiratory type of epithelium. And in image E, the MLA was positive for GATA3. As in image F, as you can see, the MLA exhibited luminal positivity for CD10. Case three, the ovarian MLA associated with the high-grade serous carcinoma. As you can see in image A, the high-grade serous carcinoma component had solid and glandular arrangements with severe nuclear atypia. Image B shows the high-grade serous component having a diffuse mutation type immunoreactivity with P53. Images C and D shows the MLA component composed of the glandular structures and quartz of cells. And the MLA was positive for TTF1, image E, and GATA3, image F. Case four, the case with the mesonephric-like differentiation with borderline ovarian endometrioid tumor the endometrioid borderline tumor component had lobular arrangements of endometrioid type glands, some of which were cystically dilated. As you can see in images A through to C, the mesonephric like tubules are present with atypical vesicular nuclei. Case five with the mixed germ cell tumor, it was observed as a biphasic tumor with both components spatially separated but closely opposed. The mixed germ cell tumor exhibited elements of immature teratoma with primitive neuroepithelium in rosettes and sheets, as you can see in image A, a yolk sac tumor element, an embryonal carcinoma element as well. And in image B shows the immature teratoma positive for cell 4. In regards to the molecular findings, 
So as you can see, there was a pathogenic KRAS variant in four of the five cases, cases one, three, four, and five. There was pathogenic or likely pathogenic pic 3 ca variants in three of the five cases in the mesonephric-like component, cases three, four, and five. And key findings was in case two, the CNV profiles of the teratoma and the MLA components um, showed overlap. Case three, there was distinct mutations in each of the components, which will be explained later. Case four, there was a pathogenic variant in the KRAS gene and a likely pathogenic variant in the PIK3CA and ARID1A genes. In this case, the two components were not analyzed separately. And case five showed both components exhibiting identical pathogenic KRAS and PIK3CA mutations. And an isochromosome 12P was identified on fish analysis. In regards to clinical outcome, so case two developed multiple metastases to the rectus abdominal muscle, the paraphysical region, omentum, and further recurrence in the bladder post-surgery. Case five had a partial re response to chemotherapy, but showed significant increase in the size of residual disease leading to ureteric obstruction post-surgery. And the remaining three patients showed no evidence of tumor recurrence during the follow-up period. In discussion, the MLA component in all four malignant cases exhibited morphologic, immunohistochemical, and molecular features similar to those reported in the literature. Although there is marked morphologic, immunophenotypic, and molecular overlap with cervical mesonephric adenocarcinoma, there are other parameters suggesting a malarian origin for MLA. So the authors note that tumors arising in the uterine corpus exhibit an origin from the endometrium. And they also note that there has been a published case report of an endometrial MLA associated with an endometrioid component. MLA is often associated with endometriosis in the ovary and in both the uterine corpus and ovary, these neoplasms have not been associated with mesonephric remnants. It is often stated in the literature that mesonephric remnants um, within the outer aspects of the myometrium. However, the authors state that they have never observed this. So the study raises a case for malarian origin. So case one, the MLA arising from extra ovarian endometriosis arose in the mesocolon, an area devoid of mesonephric remnants. And as far as the authors are aware, this represents the first report of a an MLA arising outside the uterine corpus or ovary. The study raises a case for a collision tumour, which was in case three, the MLA associated with high-grade serous carcinoma, which had distinct molecular abnormalities in the two components. So the high-grade serous carcinoma component harboured serous type mutations and the MLA component harboured MLA type mutations. And therefore the two components seem to be clonally unrelated, and this probably represents a collision tumour. And though this doesn't substantiate any evidence for malarian origin, this case represents a unique and undescribed association of MLA. So the study also raises a case for germ cell tumour origin of MLA. So the CNV profiling of both components in case two, which was the case with the mature teratoma, showed considerable overlap. And so it can be speculated that the MLA and the teratoma have a common origin. Both components of case five, which was the case with the mixed germ cell tumor, harbored identical mutations in KRAS and PIK3CA, thus confirming their clonal nature. These mutations were suggestive of the MLA being a parent neoplasm. So this is in the context of previously described cases of germ cell tumors arising in malarian neoplasms with a lack of isolation. 12p favoring their somatic origin. However, in this case, the FISH analysis showed isochromosome 12p in both components. So it is therefore unequivocally, um, it's therefore difficult to unequivocally determine whether the germ cell tumor was somatically derived from the MLA and the somatic tumor acquired 12p in its progression, or whether the entire lesion was of germ cell origin and the MLA represent, represented a secondary somatic malignancy. 
The isochromosome 12p strongly argues in favour of the MLA arising out of the germ cell tumour. It is extremely rare for malarian neoplasms to arise within a germ cell tumour. However, the molecular results in cases 2 and 5 raise this possibility. In regards to the prognosis, so MLAs are aggressive tumours and have previously dem been demonstrated as an independent risk factor for adverse patient outcome. In this study, three of the patients were uh, presented with advanced stage disease and developed tumour recurrence. Given the propensity for aggressive behaviour, it has been recommended not to grade MLAs, but to regard these as automatically high grade. In conclusion, the study reports five new cases of extrauterine mesonephric like tumours, including the first report of an ovarian borderline neoplasm exhibiting mesonephric like differentiation. The study shows the value of molecular testing in helping to confirm mesonephric like lesions and in determining the relationship between the different neoplastic components. And the study therefore provides further evidence for malarian origin of MLA. So the strengths of this study, each case contributed uniquely to the study objective, the case is skillfully chosen to highlight new MLA associations and in combination with each other, reveal immunohistochemical and molecular patterns that raise questions in regards to the origin of MLA. In regards to possible areas of improvement, it would be interesting to further categorise the MLA morphological differences between the cases, whether there were morphologic features only seen with certain associations, and in case four, if the molecular testing of the borderline endometrioid tumour with uh, the mesonephric-like components had been separated, this could have provided stronger evidence for a malarian origin. In regards to applications, all the MLA components in the study had consistent immunohistochemical and molecular features to previously reported highlighting the value of these ancillary tests in helping to confirm MLA diagnosis. The study expanded the published tumour types associated with MLA, and given their significant association with endometriosis, the authors suggest that MLA can be added to the list of endometriosis-associated neoplasms, these also comprising of endometrioid, clear cell and seromucinous neoplasms. The study also highlights the pitfalls in calling these tumours papillary thyroid carcinomas with similar nuclear features and positive staining for TTF1. MLAs are TTF1 positive and they are GATA3 positive and thyroglobulin negative. Thank you very much. Well done, Leah, thank you. If everyone would like to turn their cameras on, and unmute themselves. We've got some time for discussion. Um, as is usually the case, we don't have any questions posted by the audience, which is rather perplexing because I think there's lots of questions that arise out of these papers. And I think, Fiona, your paper is the one that um, for me uh, elicited lots of um, questions. I, I guess my main one was how, how does a metastasis lie dormant for 14 years? Um, and not come to light clinically. But um, on your paper, what, what, do you, um, what do you see as the main learning points? What, what did it teach you and, um, and what will you take into your daily practice? Um, I think well, it was such an interesting paper, but um, I think what I took away from it was despite these tumours being classified as um, pattern AEAs, um, there were certain features that were identified that um, were associated with an increased risk of ovarian metastases, and these were the, um, the corpus involvement, um, the mucinous differentiation, and the certain mutations that were specified. And, and it's really important to search out for these um, in daily practice, especially when um, ovarian preservation is being considered. Um, it was also interesting that um, the clinical and histologic features of the ovarian metastases um, tended to mimic um, an ovarian primary neoplasm. Um, and this highlighted the importance of um, considering um, metastatic EA in adenocarcinomas of the ovary, um, especially in the younger age group of women, which, um, which was studied in this, um, in this report. Um, it was also interesting, you know, 
regarding those alternative methods of spread, um, all these tumors were, you know, you know, they spread to outside of the uterus, but there was no lymph node involvement. Um, so that really does suggest an alternative method of spread, um, whether it be the intraepithelial spread or the tumor cell exfoliation. Um, but each of these methods pose additional questions that you know we can't really answer at the moment. So um, it's re it's very interesting. Mm, agree. So do you think now going forward with uh, carcinoma of the cervix in a hysterectomy specimen that we should be considering or contemplating blocking the entire endometrium in the tubes to get a sense of you know, if, if there is upward extension of the tumour? Is that something that you think we need to put into practice or at least consider? Um, yeah, I definitely think that that should be considered. Um, yeah, especially with um, that um, the question of whether you know the, there's the intraepithelial spread um, along the endometrium, um, where it's always a possibility, and um, the fact that you know there were these um, metastases that were discovered many many months later um, suggests that this could potentially be a very slow process um, upwards. So I think I think it is definitely worth considering. Um, yeah, I, I think particularly if you've got mucinous differentiation, a large tumor size, and a patient yeah. who's young and retaining her ovaries, um, for me that I guess I'm going to consider going forward. You know whether I do sample more widely, although it seems um, that in these cases the ovarian met had already landed. Um, and was already there because a number of the cases did have the endometrium completely sampled. Um, not yeah. all the tubes were sampled, but, um, and in those cases where the endometrium was completely sampled, there was only minimal disease. So it, it still leaves the question um, open as to whether a metastasis had already, presumably through exfoliation, had already occurred, but was lying dormant in the ovary. So maybe all of our additional effort um, won't actually predict uh, which mm. patients but and that's why I think this paper is so useful because it does um, draw attention to some of the morphologic cues that I guess raise yeah. concern and and molecular as well and then flipping it the other way next time you get an ovarian mucinous tumor um, and if there's something that's not quite right uh, have a low threshold for ordering a p16 asking what their cervical yeah. screening history is particularly if they're a young woman um, and personally, I have seen that scenario of the um, ovarian tumour presenting with the occult um, cervical primary or a history. I actually had a case which was just a history of AIS, um, which is fascinating um, to think that non-invasive disease can produce metastases as far as the lungs. <laughs> but mm. I guess that happens in serous carcinoma. Um, but I don't know that we think of uh, cervical adenocarcinoma as being quite as aggressive a disease. Yeah. Mm. And then that whole question of how did the Mets get to the lungs if there's no lymphovascular permeation within the ovary? Um, that's another unanswered question at this paper. Presumably it's there and it just wasn't seen. Yeah, I mean, and whether, you know, it was all sampled as well, we don't really know that yep. either. So yep. maybe in the future you know, sample more widely. Um, yeah. But yeah. 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 It doesn't cost a whole lot to go back and put more on, does it? it just yeah. takes time. Excellent. Um, Reshma, what was your yes. main learning from this paper? I know what I learned. <laughs> yeah. So I learned a lot from this paper. So, I mean, I wasn't aware that ovarian endometrioid um, neoplasms could stand positive for WT1. So that was um, something new that I learned. Um, and also just when you've got a WT1 positive neoplasm that doesn't quite fit with a low grade or serious or high grade serious carcinoma in terms of nuclear atypia, I think it's important to consider an endometrioid neoplasm. Um, and the other thing is the propensity for these neoplasms for aberrant staining. So that was another new thing. Um, and, and I guess the important thing is when you do immunohistochemistry, always use a panel of markers rather than a single marker. 
Um, so those were sort of the main takeaway messages for me. Yeah, and and if you're sure of your diagnosis, you don't need to do immunos. Yes. To it it yes, might just definitely. land you. Yeah. Um, in trouble. Might just create more confusion. It, exactly. Yeah. Um, we've actually just had a question pop up from Anthony Carnesis regarding your paper, Fioni. Did the pattern A endocervical adenocarcinoma paper mention whether any of the patients ever had an endometrial biopsy? I think is EMB endometrial biopsy, which could facilitate transport into the uterus. Maybe that's endocervical mucosal biopsy, facilitate transport uh, into the uterus and the tubes. I think. I I know. Yeah, oh, I yeah, endometrial biopsy. Thank you. Four patients presented because of an abnormal pap smear, and the other four presented with presumed ovarian primary. So I don't know that there was, um, although I guess we don't know for sure, that there was an endometrial biopsy uh, that had occurred in the mix at the time of presentation or prior to presentation. I know that one had an intraoperative endocervical curatage procedure because they attempted trachelectomy but the margins were positive and the endocervical curatage was positive. So then they aborted and went to complete hysterectomy. Um, I guess you could speculate, but that would have to be a really quick um, exfoliation to the ovaries at time of surgery. So it's probably not the mechanism. There were two patients in that paper who had endometrial curatage with their it endocervical was. curatage or with their cones. Yeah, I just searched at patients five and six. Um, I think often when they do a cone, they do an endocervical or endometrial sample as well. Although yeah. I guess usually they do an endocervical curatage, maybe mm -hmm. a little less usual to have an endometrial curatage. I guess Karen and our line of work that when I see that pattern, it's usually because of a abnormal glandular pap without sub yeah, subclassification. If you just tell them there's abnormal glandular cells, they'll do fractional curatage. Yeah. Maybe that's what he's so I guess in those those two patients, you could postulate that that might have contributed to ex cell exfoliation and dissemination to the ovaries. Mm -hmm. um, they were all pretty promptly then um, treated with hysterectomy. Yeah. yeah, so that would especially have to be... for a long interval. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, look, it, it is unclear, isn't it? But that that's that's a really interesting question. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think we can really change practice with the glandular lesions. You, you, sometimes you need a, a curette to diagnose these because we, we just can't reach them at colposcopic biopsy or a, mm -hmm. a diagnostic leap. So we've just gone over the hour, but I'll just squeeze in one. I know that went quickly, didn't it? Uh, a quick question for Leah, just because I haven't come around to you, Leah. If you want to just um, finish off by summing up for us what you learned from this experience and, and from your paper in particular, what do you think is the main yeah, takeaway? Of course, um, yeah, it was a, such an interesting paper and it was interesting to learn um, about such a new phenomenon, um, like a new addition to the WHO classification being MLA. It was interesting uh, to find out about their correlation with the mesonephric adenocarcinomas, how they can be so similar morphologically, immunohistochemically and in the molecular patterns. However, it's questionable as to where their origin is, which was, I found very interesting. And it was important to, to know about um, the fact that they have such an aggressive nature and their role in, in grading and prognosis. That was very interesting to learn about. Yeah, and I think um, the takeaway for me as a pathologist is to just be aware of, of the possibility of a mesonephric like adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. um, I guess mainly because of their adverse potential for adverse clinical behaviour. So if you see little tubules with colloid like material in the lumen, mm. um, have this in the back of your mind um, and have a high index of suspicion and do that GATA3 stain in TTF1. Um, also drawing um, that um, cautionary tale as well to um, our notice regarding the potential misdiagnosis of thyroid elements in the teratoma case. Mm. I thought that was really scary. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it. Um, we've gone over time. So thank you, everyone, um, for your participation today. Um, 
especially Theona and, Theone and Leah, just acknowledging that you're brand new to pathology. This is your first year, so super impressive effort. <laughs> yeah. um, and mm -hmm. and thank you, thank you, Reshma. And I'm hoping that you um, have a, a career uh, in gynaecology ahead of you. Look forward to working with you in the future. Um, yeah. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, thank you all. You all did a great job. Thanks so much for joining us. And thanks to our audience yeah. and um, getting some positive feedback. So thank you. Yeah. We'll see you okay. next time. Thanks all. Have a good one. Thank you. <laughs>